a frequency beyond space and time. Unspeakable knowledge. It is that tower made of no, 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 no. Hello everybody and welcome back to the long-awaited return of Mad Tower Radio. Uh, this is your host Dan and I am joined by my co-host Christian. Been, uh, lost in the woods for a minute. Hello, it's good to be back finally. Yeah, it's it's been a, been a long time coming but I'm really happy to just uh, be behind the mic today. What have you been up to in the meantime, Christian? I haven't left this room. Since our last oh, recording, I've okay. been blasting out help signs and, and Uber Eat requests since uh, May of last year, and nothing gets in. And May of last year, I actually managed to make contact with the uh, Mantis aliens, and I've been out with them. <laughs> I'd tell you guys all about it, but, you know, standard alien procedure, they had to wipe my memory. I have bits and pieces here and there, of, but I, I can't really recall you know, but, uh, oh well, at least I'm back here and ready to tell you about some stuff. Christian, if uh, we have any new listeners, why don't you go ahead and tell them what this show's all about? Oh, absolutely. So here at the Mad Tower Radio, we're trying to take a, a bit of a closer look at the world around us. And each week we come together, me and Dan, and we share another interesting, horrifying thing that we've discovered. It can be a creature, a conspiracy, a, a story that we just found pretty damn fascinating. And slowly and slowly, we're going to make our way up to the top of that mad tower and see over the entire world with our forbidden knowledge. That about sums it up. Or, but uh, what, do you, what do you got for me today, Christian? All I know is the name of it. Oh, did I did I send you a name? Yeah, you slipped the name. Okay, fantastic. So I'm pretty smitten with uh, semi vampiric uh, creatures. Mm -hmm. I'd uh, just recently read a book, and it goes into this strange uh, similarity in a bunch of different cultures throughout the world of. Uh, blood-sucking, vampiric creatures, and it really got me going. So when I knew we were coming back, I decided on the Mananangal. Okay. Does this ring any bells for you? Anything you've ever heard of? I know that you let it slip that it is a uh, it's Filipino, right? Yes, it is a creature from the Philippine Islands. See, I don't know much about the Philippines. Uh, I do know that they have, like, whack-ass vampires. So... Uh, my sort of preface for this in the green room when we were texting each other about what we wanted to do, I called this one the Filipino Cryptid War. That's pretty insane sounding right from the get-go. So it's it's going to build a little bit, but I wanted to start the discussion with this creature. Now, the, the Mananangal has some pretty standard vampiric uh, attributes, you know, goes out at night, uh, blood sucking followed by bat like creatures but the the thing that makes this one special is its translation mm -hmm. it uh loosely can be uh described as the remover or the separator oh okay mhm mm mhm mm so the the mananangal usually portrays itself as a uh, raggedy old woman, maybe sometimes a beautiful woman, but usually on the feminine side. Mm -hmm. And uh, late at night, it will do this ritual out in the woods by itself where it rips itself in half and wings sprout out from the opening of its, like, bisection. Oh. And it's just a top half vampire. Flies around just... You know, ribs up, wings out, guts, flies, confetti -ing. It just flies around in half? Yes. The top half goes out and hunts. The bottom half stays out in the woods. That's, uh, that's really weird. You know, I'm not, I haven't heard of any other cryptid or creature that, like, 
works like that where it just separates and goes, you know? It's maybe, uh, like, I'm trying to, to figure out where or what kind of culture sort of stems this kind of monster because, uh, like the book says, a lot of these uh, creatures that we build comes from our the culture around us, the, the environment we're a part of. I don't know if there's any, like, lizards that you know lose their tails in the philippines or that's something that though these people see a lot but it yeah <laughs> it's crazy so i'm so gonna send you, you the, the first photo us, you mean like uh of the would it say like Mongo? like uh the physical makeup or of like the world around them in that area or do you mean the culture where like the monster reflects I mean, that as well. Both of those uh, aspects are what goes into the creating the, the cryptids that haunt a certain society. Yeah. So take a look at that. Yeah. It's sick. And they're known uh, to hunt pregnant women. Specifically? Uh, they, uh, in some myths, love the taste of uh, fetuses inside the belly. Ah. So they're going to go for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's, that's an acquired taste, certainly. <laughs> that they'll uh, use their tongue to, you know, go get that fetus. Like a reverse uh, xenomorph, if you would. Mm. Hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, and, that's like... You know, that's like brutal. Th this thing, it, it lives so strongly from what i can tell in uh filipino culture the first film ever uh produced in the philippines was about this monster called the mananangal hmm. there's a uh, a survival horror uh, video game where you're running from the beast really mm -hmm. so like it's pretty popular in their culture huh uh, from from what i can tell it at least lives pretty firmly in people's minds it's a well-known creature from that area have you seen uh trace on netflix no, i think that's what, what it's that? called uh it's like a new anime that's like uh adapted from a filipino um graphic novel and it's like about mm. uh like this girl who's like a cryptid hunter I will definitely check that out and try to find this beast in that so, show. I'm that... thinking that if we give it a watch, the Menengal is probably in there. And that's pretty cool. And it it's a pretty fleshed out myth. Like it, it there's a lot of sort of things you can do to combat this beast. There's, you know, the usual salt circle, there's garlic, there's, you know the stingray tail a stingray they, tail they don't like the tail of the stingray you can make a whip and fight it back with that <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite one if you do not want a mananongal to come back yeah. when it goes out at night and it hunts it you know separates top from bottom uh-huh if you can go out in the woods and find its bottom half you can destroy it or move it. And if it doesn't uh, put its two halves back together by the time the sun comes up, it's done. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> you just, like, hide its legs. Conversely, imagine that, like, you're walking through the woods and you just see, like, a pair of legs. I think that'd be, that'd be equally as bad as seeing the Menonongle. Yeah, if you just find its bottom half... No thanks. So you said no you said something about the Filipino cryptid uh, war. Um, yes. So where does the war come in? There's uh, there's a second half to this uh, this creature that I'd like to let you know about. So uh, what is your familiarity with the sort of post war, uh, the Second World War, with the Philippines? Not much, but I know that in recent uh, in recent years, uh, the Philippines have started their own war on drugs. <laughs> and That's true. 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't seem that far fetched to me if the president of Philip of the Philippines started giving out bounties for the men in Angol as well. <laughs> so, uh, during the Second World War, the Japanese Imperial Army invades the islands, yeah. as it does, you know, most of Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and that begins a pretty widespread um, home resistance. Uh huh. Now, after the war, the United States does what it does best, comes on in not a year after the war ends, I believe, and it says, okay, we're going to help install order, help rebuild the country after this long, devastating war. Yeah. And they were not met with... Um, flowers and and roses and yeah and, yeah uh, you know you know so there's this fine gentleman by the name of uh let me find it here air force brigadier general edward g lansdale uh-huh ever heard of the fella nope never in my life dudes in charge of uh, controlling the rebel forces keeping these locals from you know causing too much damage while the united states is nation building in the philippines uh-huh so i'm gonna read you a quote from his memoir after he'd gotten out after his tour of duty had ended yeah so air force brigadier general edward g lansdale says a combat psi war squad was brought in it planted stories among town residents of an Anzwang, which is a catch-all term for cryptids, and in this case, meaning the Mananangal. Okay. So it plants the story among town residents of a Mananangal living in the hill where the rebels were based. Two nights later, after giving the story some time, the Psy War squad makes their way up to a hill camp and sets an ambush for the rebels. When the patrol comes, they are ambushed silently, snatched up, and punctured in the neck. What? Vampire style. Yeah, they're poked in the neck and left hanging by their heels so that their blood will drain. Holy shit. They strung up these rebels and <laughs> allowed other uh, comrades to come and find their bloodless comrades who <laughs> believed that the Mananongo got them and they would be next if they remained in those hills. So when daylight came, Edward G. Lansdale says the whole squadron moved out. That's fucking insane. Mm-hmm. Damn. Mm -hmm. Man used local myth, used, you know, local terror to get the job done. Wow, that's fucking... That's fucking crazy, actually. Like, imagine if a a foreign army finds itself in the United States and starts leaving like fake Bigfoot traps around, or it, it like makes Jersey <laughs> Jersey Devil attacks happen in your area. That'd be fucking crazy. <laughs> or like they start planting bombs on your bridges, so you think the Mothman's here coming for your infrastructure. <laughs> See, I've always like, I've always like wondered about that. Is like, how many times have we been fooled by like a scene that was just meant to look like it was a cryptid or Bigfoot or the Mononongle or anything, and like we just like they it worked and you know we bought it, and like this completely unexplained event was just totally staged. Hmm. Does anything you know? uh, particular come to mind? Um, no. <laughs> okay. Not really, actually. So I I just found this instance so interesting because of sort of the the intersection between you know the myth and the culture and like real practical business being done with that fear. Like it, it seemed like a really tangible effect that like if you believe in something you know you can manifest that in places like if you think about cryptids all the time and you're worried about them you know you're 
<laughs> you're gonna see some things out in the woods at night oh you know what I'm saying? yeah and i mean that's like see like as being someone that's as into this whole uh cryptid culture as i am you know like i i i have to have everything view this skepticism you know because if mm-hmm. i just believe any joe off the street that's just like yeah i saw bigfoot he fucking ran through my backyard and like did a fucking backflip and like the Fortnite dance and <laughs> ran back into the woods you know like if i just believe every tom dick and harry that says they saw bigfoot like i don't know man like it's just it loses like i'm gonna i'm gonna trick myself into eventually being like any stick snapping in the woods is like oh fuck that was bigfoot that was bigfoot and like i just think if you're really into cryptids you should probably have a lens of skepticism so that you're not getting your chain yanked you know that's sort of the mentality i had to put in especially when we were getting into some of these conspiracy theories earlier on in the show i approached them you know kind of wanting to be a part of it but also having to sort of separate myself from jumping in head first if that makes sense yeah oh yeah you know that that being said though if any tom dick or harry is walking down the street and wants to tell me about a monster that they saw yeah i want to hear that oh i'm all ears um, tell me about come, it <laughs> come find me tell me about it because that shit would be awesome yeah but like no. I, I don't know. Have you ever heard stories before where you can just tell that the person is being, like, super genuine, and then you hear other stories, and you're like, all right, about half of this is fucking, like, made up? There's there's a certain energy, a certain, yeah, sincereness, yeah, that people will give you. That That's the stuff that sort of makes me uh, <laughs> give it a second thought. Uh-huh. Because, I mean, no way do I think that there's people, like, there's no way that everyone and their mother is just like, oh, dude, I'm going to lie about a Bigfoot sighting for fame, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, there's no way that every single person is just like, oh, dude, I can just lie about this and get famous, you know? There's, I think it's got to be in, like, thirds, you know, where, like one like the first third they're making it up the second third is like just absolute ignorance you know it was a bear but they saw it from an angle okay and that like oh shit that's bigfoot and they just don't know any better and then like the the third has got to be i gotta i gotta believe it man you know i've heard some stories where i'm just like why would you make this up you know, there there is a particular uh, peer that I have who is controlled by the fear of seeing this creature that he's seen twice before. That yeah, it, I am pretty pretty willing to give him my faith. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I have heard plenty of stories that I'm just like, I'm like fuck, that's I don't know, <laughs> that's that's nuts, that's real. You know, I don't know what you saw, but I don't want to see it. You know, and it, it always makes it better when it comes with, like, just that sliver of, like, what you could consider yes. hard evidence, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I actually yeah. have a story like that for you today. Ooh. When uh, it, it just has that tiny little sliver of hard evidence, and it's pretty fucking cool. But, uh, please... I didn't mean to derail us this far from the Mononongo, please. That's I'd, I'd pretty much given you everything I had for my short little report. There is one other pretty interesting uh, detail. I had told you that they, they fly around with an entourage of bats. Oh, yeah. They're bat-like creatures, let's say. They have an advanced strategy where... Uh, they'll they'll make this um clicking noise uh-huh. right and the farther away the clicking noises sound the closer 
the Mononongal is supposed to be to you. Like it, it casts its clicks farther away so that you think it's somewhere else. Like it's, it's said to be very good at like tricking you with sound. Damn, that's that's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Is there like a large mm-hmm. bat population in the Philippines? Honestly, no clue. I don't know what's <laughs> up with bats. Bats are crazy. They're everywhere. Because uh, you know, there's some giant giant bats Mm -hmm. you know and like if Mm -hmm. you saw one flying at night you know you could easily think you saw them on an angle you know oh absolutely let me let me give you this next picture this is a monongal sighting photo oh i'm excited for this so tell me what you see there you go (laughs) so that's the top half of a demon yeah, that's just the top half of a demon. It looks like it has horns. He kind of looks like um, the bad gremlin. <laughs> Spike? Mo- Mohawk man. Yeah, Spike. Kind of looks like Spike. That's pretty good. That's pretty funny, actually. Let me look up the Philippines bat population. Because I just want to know that's... if, like, there's enough mm-hmm. bats there for you to just be like, oh. You know, to be like, oh, okay. That's There he bat. is. Or if, like, this is just something completely foreign, you know? And it seems to be a pretty uh, stalwart piece of uh, culture. I had, I'd seen this interview where a guy who's, like, an office worker in the capital, he's, like, an older dude, and he's like, yeah, i seen him. Like, he came for uh-huh. this lady I live next to. Okay, check this out. The- okay. <laughs> The giant golden crowned flying fox, also known as the golden capped fruit bat, is a species of mega bat endemic oh, to the Philippines. Shit. Not the mega bat. Here, I'm gonna send you an image right here. Great. I could uh, easily mistake this as the top half of a person. For sure. Oh, sh- <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, no, it, it's a flying fox, not a bat. No, that's a dude. That's a man. Yeah. Oh, I don't. God. That I'm... doesn't even need to be. That doesn't even need to be a fucking. A cryptid. Like, if I saw that, like, it's time to go home. <laughs> <laughs> Forever. <laughs> I hate this so much. Here's another that... one. Oh. <laughs> He's huge. Picture of a human-sized bat from the Philippines goes viral. Or goes viral, netizens spooked out. Yeah, no, I, I could definitely understand a late at night walking at sunset or something like that, and you see this beast and coming you, out over yeah, the tree line. you see that. Oh, yeah. I don't know about that. I love this. Overall, yeah, Mononongal, A-plus monster. Sick design, cool story, nice, like, historical incidents. Like, it's it's all around a fantastic story. I, I like the Mononongal. It's pretty cool. It's interesting. It's got a unique design. Because, like, as much as I love cryptids, I get tired of, like, Bigfoot likes. You know, hairy monkey, and yeah. it'll have like such a cool name too. And they'll be like, "Oh, what is it?" And it's like it's just a big hairy thing in the woods, and it's like, "Okay, yeah. no thanks." Yeah, yeah. So is every other cryptid. You know. Yeah. So I'm gonna do a little bit of after school work. I'm gonna try maybe see a couple scenes from a movie, maybe find that game, and get a little more in depth. That'd be cool. What's the name of that game? Yeah. Do you have it on hand? Oh, God. I had it just a minute ago. Good thing we're editing this. I remember it. Ha- we don't have to put this in, but I remember it looking like shit. <laughs> it is a, it's a Filipino game. Filipino survival. Oregon? Night. It's it's a game from 2016 developed in the Philippines called Nightfall Escape. Ah. 
Ooh, hoo, hoo. I'm definitely checking this out. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's on Steam. I did not know that's how the Mononongo was spelled. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's got 2.2 stars on Steam. Hell yeah. Yeah, so that's that's my creature for this week. Uh, I'm salivating, practically chomping at the bit to hear about this I know, uh, special thing you've got for me. Because I, I just get such a rush from teasing you about what I'm bringing. Uh, <laughs> don't take that clip out of context ever, nah, please. Fine. But um, yeah, it, it is so much fun for me to just be like, yeah, hey, you ever heard of this? And you're like, uh, no. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I'll drop you like a picture here and there of it. And you're just like, I fucking hate this thing already. Uh, this this week's little teaser photo was tremendous. So please, please go on. Okay, yeah. Um, without further ado, I'd like to tell you about the uh, the Glimmer Man. The Glimmer Man. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. So uh, you spend a lot of time in the woods. <laughs> Me particularly. Yeah, you particularly uh not as much as i would like but i'm i'm an avid woods guy yeah you ever been like you're out in the woods and just been like something's off uh without going into too much detail i felt that way uh with you not too long ago oh really yeah we when we went on our camping trip uh, a couple months ago i I got a little spooked at one point. Oh, we don't have to. Can you, can you tell the story without doxing anybody? Nah, it's it's. We'll save that for another one. We'll have a personal experiences episode. Oh baby, I'm. That's gonna be a fun episode. Mm-hmm. Is it because I made you sleep on the ground? It's, I slept beneath the Lord's stars. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like. So this. This creature, right, people report they'll just be out in the woods and it'll be a normal day and it has such a varied range of reports. And, uh, mm. but one thing that's really, really common in all of them, well, in most of them, is that, like, the woods go dead fucking quiet. Like, not, no birds, no wind, no animals, like, nothing. Just dead silence. Oh, and hey, I mean, ugh. usually a couple seconds after they notice this, they will notice the glimmer man, right? <laughs> and I, I shit you not, man. Almost every single one of these sightings, they they describe it as they always go, "Have you seen the predator?" Like the movie. Oh, like the 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 cloaking, yeah, like shimmer. They will see like the shimmer cloaking effect from the predator movie just standing off in the distance people will see it appear from a lake but a lot of times people see it just appear out of thin air man and that's it's, that's the only way they can describe it is like the predator is it like a, a north american phenomenon is it um, it is mainly North American, but, okay. um, there's been some international stories as well. I read one from Peru, but, uh, it's weird because, uh, I initially thought that this like only took place in the woods. It doesn't. Majority of it takes place in the woods, but people have also claimed that like, they'll just see like the glimmer man out of the corner of their eye. And, like, he just runs across the room, and he's gone. I, for, for y'all who don't know, I've, I I battle night terrors, something fierce. And, like, hearing that sentence just, like, like dropped me. Yeah. <laughs> put, my, put my gut down. Uh, oh, my God, bro. I was working a 24-hour shift. I was up late. I was by myself. And, like, there were windows all around me, and it was, like, pitch black. And, like, I mm-hmm. 
I was just working in silence, just like listening to the click clack of my keyboard and like I don't know. Every time I read one, it was like, yeah, I saw the Glimmer Man out of the corner of my eye, and he sprinted across the room. I, like, every time I read one of those, I would, like, lean in closer to my computer to where I had, like, no peripheral vision. <laughs> yeah, that reminds me of uh, working overnight shifts, yeah, at in glass homes that look out into the woods. Yeah, to fucking hate that. Oh, man, glass homes that live out in, or look out into the woods? Hate hate that a lot so is it does it touch you does it let me uh, let me go ahead and get into uh some sightings because a lot of people report different things most of the time people just report like it's there and it's gone right so this one Mm. comes from a uh student at the university of florida um she went out hiking with her dog one day on the Gainesville Hawthorne uh, State Trail. And here you go. Well, on this particular day, me and Toby, my dog, were about four miles into the trail. It was a weekday around 11 a.m., so there were very few people. At the time of our encounter, there was no one around, just me and Toby. As we were walking, I was just looking around as we hiked, you know, looking for wildlife, enjoying the sun and Mother Nature and all of her beauty. When all of a sudden, Toby froze. He saw something. He just stood there with his ears perked up, his tail sticking straight out, and he was staring into the trees. I assumed he saw some birds or something else in the trees, so I asked him, What do you see, Toby? What is it, boy? He didn't bark, but I could tell something had caught his attention. While he continued to stare, I started looking in the same direction as he was, trying to see what he was looking at. At this point, Toby's demeanor started to change. His tail went from sticking straight out to now lower between his legs. He began to whimper a little, and started pulling on the leash like he wanted out of there. I continued to look into the trees, trying to spot whatever it was that was scaring him, and that's when I saw it. It's very hard to describe, but this thing looked clear, but not quite. It was in the shape of a human, meaning that it had a head, torso, two arms, and two legs. It was see-through. The thing that stood out the most was the glowing yellow eyes. That was the only thing that wasn't clear. As crazy as it sounds, this thing looked like the alien in the Predator movies whenever it was cloaking itself. It was standing on a large tree branch, hanging on by its right arm, and was looking directly at me and Toby. It slowly began to crouch down and tried to hide behind the trunk of the tree like it noticed us noticing him. I don't know why I say him. I absolutely have no idea the sex of this strange creature, if that's what you want to call it. I tried to hide, like I said, but you could still see portions of it behind the tree. I was frozen. I was mesmerized by this thing. I was just staring at it, trying to figure out what it was. I didn't want to take my eyes off of it in fear that I might lose it. This thing was so damn camouflaged. If I looked away, I might not be able to find it again. So I just stared, ignoring Toby and his whimpers. Then it moved. It swung through the trees effortlessly and made almost no sound. It would move to a few trees, then freeze, look back at us, I guess to determine if we were watching it or not. I got the feeling this thing did not want to be seen. It would move, then freeze, crouch down, and put itself between us and the tree it was in. Oh. (laughs) It would sit there for a few minutes, then move again. I wanted to follow it, but everything in my body said no. So I just watched, and eventually it disappeared into the forest. So that's uh, it's okay. a lot of times it's just observing. You know, that's horrifying, but okay. Now, uh, here's an excerpt from another story that I took, and this one is uh, this one takes place in a uh, house. At some point. I felt like I wasn't alone. I glanced over at the door leading to the dining room, and I saw it, and I was struck with fear. Standing right inside the doorway was what I can only describe as the predator, except it was human (laughs) in shape and size. It couldn't have been any taller than me, and I'm only 5'7". It didn't move. It stood fixed in that position for several seconds. Then it lunged forward and crossed the room very quickly. All I could do was close my eyes and cover my face and I felt air brush my hands and arms like something had moved quickly towards me. After what felt like several minutes, I managed to convince myself to lower my arms and open my eyes. 
I was alone in the room. Whatever was there was not anywhere to be seen. So, it's My a lot of varying God. reports. Like, it's there, and then mm-hmm. it notices that you noticed, and then it just dips out. You know? That's the worst. Yeah. Like, like the, the interaction that you have with it is so interesting. Yeah, like, it's just there, and then it's just gone, you know? So, there's a lot of... A lot of theories as to what it is because mm-hmm. of this right there's theories that it's like cloaked aliens uh there's theories that it's uh actually cloaked humans and it's like advanced military tech yeah that's but, kind of where I, my mind was going i don't know because like none of these bases or none of these uh stories say anything about being near like a military base or something like that yeah but then mm-hmm. again if you have an invisible suit, you know, maybe it's at an invisible base. You know what I mean? God, God damn it. There's there's hundreds of government buildings that we just don't know exist. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm certain of it. Right? And then another theory is uh, interdimensional beings, which, I mean, that can make yeah. sense to me as in, like, you know, because in some of these stories, it's like, it's just there, and it's gone, and it doesn't really care if you saw it or not. So maybe it's like something just pressing on the barrier between our dimension and theirs. Maybe like a fourth dimensional being that's yeah like close to the fifth or third dimension, you know? Th- what, what kind of shadow does a fourth dimensional being leave yeah yeah exactly like fuck that okay it's like refracting it's it's just weird you know what i wonder what sightings like these are like in a culture that isn't so into the predator movies say again i'm sorry like what uh what is a sighting like for a person who isn't so intimately familiar with the predator films well like i don't know a lot of people uh you know a lot of people they have a sighting they have an experience and they know the stigma around having an encounter down deep inside yeah and they're like i'm just never gonna talk about it you know have, and have then like of, um oh keep go, keep go ahead they find out that there are other people that have had encounters and then they start to talk about it so some of these encounters are from like 1970 1960 1980 i read a lot of encounters last night but mm-hmm. um they'll like now that they're just now confessing to it and being like look i have to share this story the easiest thing to compare it to is the predator because you're right. Sure. How would you describe that? You know, like like hearing these stories and sort of going through a an encounter in my mind. It, it makes me think of that. Um, I don't know if it's like a a, a condition or like a psychological uh, process. Uh, it's called like par- pareidolia, I think. Pareidolia. It's yeah, it's the phenomenon where people like they see faces in patterns. It's it's part of like our pattern recognition in our brain that like we'll see like a man in the moon or oh, we'll see like okay. yeah, yeah, Jesus yeah. Christ's face on a napkin or something. Yeah, Jesus in the toast. Yeah, like it's like if it's something with that part of our brain like building something that we can recognize and it may be something that our minds cannot handle like trying to build something for us to visualize oh 100 percent. i mean uh we talked about this on our last episode over a year ago like <laughs> um like our brain would make something to fill the gaps because like you said our brain is pattern recognition based so like if we're seeing something and we have no fucking 
clue what to make of it, our brain would try to do something, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, I don't know. It's, it could be something like that, you know? Maybe, maybe this is just how we see a fourth dimensional being, you know? That, that makes me really uncomfortable. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I got uh, one more, one more sighting for you. Okay. And then I'll get into the really, really, really juicy part of this. Oh, please do. It was the fall of 1978, deer season in particular. I live near a very small town called Suches, Georgia. It only has a population at that time around 1,000 people. It's in the southeast end of the Chattahoochee National Forest. I'm an avid hunter, and I was hunting on public land in the National Forest just up the road from Suchi's in in an area called Cooper's Creek. I had scouted out the area during the summer, so late July or early August. I knew where all the game trails were. I knew where water was located, which happens to be a small creek known as Bryant Creek. And I knew where all the ridges and gaps were. I've hunted in and around this area for years and was very familiar with the area. Well, when I finally located a good spot, or at least a spot I thought would give me a good chance at a large buck, I set up my lock on tree stand. I set up my lock on tree stand in a tree about 12 feet off the ground. I trimmed the branches to give me some shooting lanes, and was basically all set for deer season. Oh, I was hunting with a 12 gauge shotgun. <laughs> Rifle hunting is not allowed in the area. Okay, cool. Good, good job following the rules. So fast forward to early November, I had been hunting out of my tree stand about six times. By the time this particular hunt happened, it was late afternoon, around 4.15pm. I wanted to get there earlier, but work held me up. We had hired this new kid named Ryan. Now this was my normal routine for a Friday afternoon during deer hunting season, and my wife knew that I would not be home until around 8.30pm, and even later if I bagged something. I parked my truck at the trailhead and started hiking into the woods to find my tree stand. The walk would take about 15 to 20 minutes. You want to walk pretty quickly, but not run. You don't want to make too much noise moving through the woods. You don't want to spook any of the wildlife. Mm. So, do you ever wonder, do you think that the Glimmer Man is telling himself that as he's moving through the woods? And we're the wildlife? You you don't want to awaken the lower life forms and freak them out. (laughs) As I was walking to my stand, the very first thing I noticed was how quiet it was. I mean, it was very quiet. I didn't hear any of the normal chirping or singing birds, no insects, nothing, and only a slight breeze. I thought it was a bit strange, but continued on to my deer stand. I finally arrived and climbed up and settled in. Once I was comfortable, I jacked I jacked around into the chamber, put the safety on my shotgun, and began surveying my surroundings, looking for anything out of place. Sometimes deer bed down during the day, and you can spot their antlers. The, you can spot their antlers above the tall grass and underbrush. As I was doing this, I began to have this ominous feeling that someone was watching me. I don't really know how to explain it, other than I had this deep feeling deep within me, in my core, in my gut, something wasn't right. Well, I tried to ignore it for a while, telling myself to stop being such a coward. There's nothing out here but you, some deer hopefully, some squirrels, skunks, and other little critters. As time passed, the feeling only intensified. Kept looking at my watch, wondering how much time I had left until dusk. Should I leave early? I thought to myself. Of course not. The huge deer was probably only moments away. As I was sitting there arguing with myself, I caught movement to my right side in the trees. I slowly turned my head and began looking through the tree canopy, and that's when I saw it. This is the part that still gives me chills. Even writing this now freaks me out, because I honestly don't know what I saw. As I was staring into the trees, I saw what looked like a large bodybuilder, but completely blurry moving through the trees. I could clearly see the outline of the figure, but the rest was blurry, like I couldn't focus on it. It looked like a clear, gelatinous blob, but in the shape of a human, a large human. And whenever it would stop, I completely lost sight of it. It blended into its background perfectly. I just watched it for what seemed like an eternity, 
but in actuality, it was like more like 15 minutes. It moved through the trees effortlessly, effortlessly, like a monkey or squirrel. It never really looked at me while I was watching it. Maybe it was right before, and that's why I got the feeling someone was watching me. I don't know. It slowly moved off, and I was scared. And I was scared about my walk back to my truck. So I waited another 30 minutes. It was getting dark, and now I slowly climbed out of my stand. Once I hit solid ground, I wasted no time. I sprinted all the way back to my truck, jumped into the cab, and my lungs were on fire. That was the farthest and fastest I've run since basic training back in 1967. (laughs) I just sat there in my truck and tried to regain my breath. I drove home and said nothing to my wife or anyone else for a few weeks. And uh, he then goes on to talk about in 1988, when he saw the Predator for the first time, he goes, that's what I saw. And, uh... Rocks. That's so cool. So, yeah, there you go. That's how someone who's never seen the Predator would describe it, you know? Yeah. But to have that, like, that moment in the theater is super, super interesting. Oh, I would go, I would go absolutely apeshit if that happened in the theater. If, if I ever see a film and, like like something that like happens and one of my night terrors shows up in there i'm gonna lose my goddamn mind (laughs) i'm gonna freak out yeah that would be that would be absolutely insane Mm -hmm. so now i want to move into that thing i told you about where it has that sliver of evidence okay now uh have you ever seen the missing 411 documentaries the missing 411 documentaries. I believe you you were talking to me about this uh, prior. Uh, just a, a very tertiary, like, I've heard it. Well, it's there are a series of documentaries and books about mysterious disappearances. And uh, I wanted to include this one because it's insane. It's not a disappearance, but uh, the guy who does these documentaries i can't remember his name it's david polites i might be butchering that but whatever so this is in uh lima ohio right a woman named uh jan maccabee and her husband bruce maccabee uh live in lima ohio and her husband bruce is a optical physicist right so and uh they're both outdoorsmen and uh they own enough land that they can hunt on their own property so jan has a uh a deer stand set up maybe like a hundred feet into their property right and so she goes and gets up in there and uh she says that in her deer stand she can hear uh the high school band practicing some two miles away and that'll be important later, but you know, okay. she's an experienced uh, she's an experienced hunter, right? And she pulls out her phone, took some pictures because she's you know it's the first first day of the season. She's excited to hunt, and then you know it's the dead silence, right? That comes in these stories like no nothing. Oh, right? oh, oh no. <laughs> and she thinks that she has something in her eyes, right? Like an eye floater. And so she tries, like, wiping it away, but it's still there. Oh, bro. <laughs> and she describes it as a large piece of saran wrap, which is a very, very strange description of this thing to me. But imagine if you saw a piece of saran wrap stretched behind two trees and, like, the shimmer that it would make. Yeah. Right? Okay. Like, a sort of, like, soap bubbly, like, light ref- reflection. Yeah, like, it's okay. refracting light, you know? Like, it, okay. there's nothing there except the reflection, mm-hmm. right? And she said it was hanging on the tree, and then it reaches over to the next tree, 12 to 14 feet away, and it moved like an amorphous blob, and then was just gone. And she said that encounter lasted about 9 to 11 seconds, Right? So, like I said, Jan was taking pictures on her phone, and uh, this is nuts, right? So, her husband, the optical physicist, 
he was like, he was like, oh, tell me more. Oh, you took pictures. Let me see your phone. Right. So she took pictures on her phone, which at the time, it was a Blackberry Pearl 8130. That was the model of the phone, right? And the native resolution of photos taken on that phone is 1024 by 768. Right? All right. But there is a single picture that she took, like, while she was out in the woods, that had a automatic resolution of 528 by 400 right and they don't okay. they don't say in the video or they don't say in the documentary if she was trying to get a picture of the uh of whatever she saw of the glimmer man right mm-hmm. but i'm going to send you a picture of what she like here's a picture that she took like one of just her normal pictures of her out hunting Right, and all right. That's in the native rev- resolution, right? And here is the picture she took that, for some reason, has an edited, like pre-edited resolution. And uh, it's important because you know, a lot of people report in like alien sightings that um. They can make electronics faulty. Okay. Um, hmm. But now look look at that picture that I sent you, the one that's in the weird resolution. Yeah, Like for sure. That's weird. It looks exactly like what she's describing. Yeah, like, like I'm looking at maybe the surface of like water or something, like lights, like yeah. being weird, yeah. So... She has that picture, and they have no idea what it is, right? Now, um, their nephew, a kid named Matthew, who went to that high school, emailed uh, Bruce, the optical physicist, that, no shit, they saw a UFO during band practice. Okay, same, same night? Same, same night. Time. This, was, this was around sundown. Right, they were okay. they were hanging out around dusk. The band was practicing two miles away at the high school on the football field, and they saw <clears throat> like a bright light that, the way they described it, like fluctuated in like brightness and like size, and then just disappeared. And these sightings happened at around the same time. That's amazing yeah it's it's fucking crazy it's so weird no two isolated incidents around the same time and you know so the reason that i read the first part of that last story that i did before this one right and i wanted to bring this up is like a lot of these guys they don't want to seem crazy right so they'll tell you all their all their qualifications i guess like this guy's clearly an experienced hunter and he's been in the area for a super long time yeah they were (laughs) they were detailed they were meticulous yeah and if you're doing something every day right if you're going through your daily routine you're gonna notice when something is fucking weird right that makes sense to me yeah like that's why like i don't know it's just like these guys are these guys have been in the woods their whole life and then like one day they see something weird and they like convince themselves they're like they're like dude i'm not crazy but like what the fuck did i just see a a lot of these stories had that that sort of Thing that I was I was trying to describe that like that just instinctual that gut thing yeah that fucking that genuineness you know yeah mm-hmm. but <laughs> let me move into the next portion of this right so let's move the movie the predator right the predator so the man who oversaw the design for 
the cloaking effect of the predator. That man is named uh, Joel Heinick, right? And he's okay. worked in the CGI, or he's worked in movies for a while. He did CGI or like special effects for a lot of stuff. Now that man's father <coughs> is a man named J. Allen Heinick, who was a astronomer and was brought on to work on two UFO projects in the U.S. government. Project Sign and Project Blue Book. Oh my man. Now, Heineck was brought on for scientific analysis and like to be a consultant. And he was, an, he was a skeptic originally. But he changed his mind. Here's a quote from J. Allen Heineck. Ridicule is not part of the scientific method, and people should not be taught that it is. The steady flow of reports, often made in concert by reliable observers, raises questions of scientific obligation and responsibility. So, what do you think? Did this? Did J. Allen Hynek tell little baby Joel a story about a cloaked alien, and that was the inspiration for the Predator? And it was the same cloaked man that everyone is seeing now. Like, isn't that isn't that fucking insane? Do you, there's there's definitely this this sort of line, for sure. And <laughs> I'm I'm just trying to like I'm drawing it in my head as we speak. Like this is this this man works in UFO adjacent projects. Yeah. And yeah, talks to his son, speaks, tells these stories, or tries to discuss them, I don't know, at the dinner table. Yeah. Absolutely. I could see someone being influenced by that their whole life and then finding themselves in, like, artistically expressing that. Oh my gosh. I need to watch Predator again. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Researching all this, I was like, I, I was telling my wife, I was like, hey, honey, you want to watch, uh, <laughs> want to watch Predator? And she's like, I do not want to watch fucking Predator. And I'm like, well, it was worth a shot. <laughs> but, uh, you oh know. Oh my gosh. Maybe she'll come around. Maybe I can get her on Alien. The There's something about this one. This, uh... Did you like that? Like... I, I saved the best for last. That connection is absolutely mind-blowing to me. I'm like there. This one was just such a such a roller coaster. Like some of these stories were so visceral. They were so like. Oh yeah, the stories mm. are insane. Like I, I'm, I'm, I frequently when I hear stories like this, like a sighting or or an alleged encounter i try to put myself in their shoes like i i react very empathetically and i'm just like you know there's a difference between a, a gust in the wind like like something moving and like seeing something you oh know? for sure yeah there's definitely a difference between like being creeped out because i've been creeped out i get creeped out all the time i spend a lot of time in the woods i spend a lot of time camping you know i've been creeped out but I've never been like, what was that? You know? Like, yeah, I'm I'm definitely more prone to the the immediate, like, startled. It's not I've never truly felt that slow, tense, like rising fear that's being described. Like that recognition of something being wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I want to feel it. I imagine it's like the startle, but it never goes away. Fuck that, bro. And the other, the other part that got me was the uh, the animals. Just the dead silence. The the there's you know pretty extensive um, reporting on animals sensing things like natural disasters or sensing like things going wrong. So like seeing and hearing. Like the environment uh, responding to these events, uh, it fucking haunts me. Oh yeah, oh yeah. If it's ever <laughs> silent in the woods, like I'm leaving. <laughs> I 
I had thought at one point uh, during the story, you you had talked about the the band students playing, and during the interaction with the Glimmer Man, this person uh, couldn't hear anything. Like the 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 woods went silent where they're at. Yeah, I thought like something about the Glimmer Man had like a like a sound dampening around it or something. Like it somehow like didn't allow noise to escape its vicinity or something like that. Ooh. It was like, oh my God. That's if you're, crazy. If you're near it, you can't hear or something. Yeah. Huh. That makes sense. Oh. I mean, if this, if we are to believe that this is like technology, you know, that, like, that'd be insane. I mean, obviously this is like, it's got to be for something like observation, right? Or in a, in like a like a physics sense, like if if light isn't reacting in a way that we expect, maybe sound is also like sound waves are also being weird in a way that we don't expect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So I don't know, man. The glimmer, man. It's fucking wild. I'm I'm gonna put my money down on like dimensional beings. That's what's sitting right with me after hearing the story. Okay, so dimensional beings, right? Do you think it's accidental or there's intent? Like they're just going about their daily lives and they don't even realize they're brushing up against the barrier, or do you think they're like reaching out, being like, "Hey, it's like how often in your day." Do you go around thinking about what your actions are doing to, like, the microbes on your finger? I guess that makes sense. But that's where I'm initially going. But a lot of these stories talk like there's some kind of exchange. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Interaction. So maybe it's it's more like, like a fly. Like, you're not really thinking about it. But once it, like, gets into your attention, you're like, what the fuck is this? Yeah, I mean it's cam- it's camouflage, you know. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Maybe maybe that sound dampening aura, right? If if all sound is gone around you, right, and like, you know, that would cause me to be like, "What the fuck?" and start looking a little closer. Yeah, you, you start know? stressing out. You start looking. You start acting a little strange. Yeah. Maybe it has like this sound dampening aura and you know it could be around you all the time but when it gets close enough for you to like not hear a goddamn thing like then you might start looking a little harder and then you might see the glimmer man when you know something's up yeah like i was saying i mean there's like a lot of encounter there's some encounters where you know the glimmer man doesn't even notice you and you notice him Mm -hmm. and then there's other accounts where it's like you look at him and he's fucking looking back, you know? So I, I really don't know where to put my finger on this, but it's, it's that kind of story or this sort of, uh, dot connecting moments. And this is really like spine tingling, uh, that really makes me glad that this is happening. That that really like makes this uh, show, like, makes me excited to do it. That that was a tremendous journey to go on to like sit there and think about this thing yeah. out there. I love that. Well, you know, I'm happy I can keep you entertained with the uh, Glimmer Man, and I'm thank terrified. you for teaching me about the Mononongo and the. Uh, fucking war crimes that were committed in its name (laughs) but i mean uh you got anything else to say to the people listening all i can think of is uh look over your shoulder every once in a while just take take a look yeah and if you see any kind of shimmering in the night or any other interesting, cursed, horrifying encounter that you would like to share with us, we would absolutely love to hear it at supermadtower at gmail.com or on our Twitter page at Mad Tower Radio.
please, folks, reach out to us. Tell us your stories. Share in our scent up the mad tower. Thanks. Well, uh, this has been Mad Tower Radio, and at this time, we are ending transmission. <laughs>